Rain, rain, go out. No. Come um, again another day. English. This rain is not going away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. You know, um, the rains are a part of our lives, so there really isn't anything we can do about it. However, um, we can ensure that the consequences of the rains don't uh, get us in the wrong places. Back as far back as February this year, the NIMET, Nigeria Meteorological Agency, released the uh, 2024 seasonal climate prediction forecasting a late onset of rain across um, the country. Now, late onset? Yes. It's come already. Well, then. Okay. So, hmm. the forecast uh, projected that uh, the rains may be delayed in some states, but the coastal areas will still experience flooding. Mm -hmm. uh, blocked drains, especially in areas where flood waters uh, easily accumulate and generate a strong force, uh, should be cleared and subsequently kept free. These and other measures must be taken to minimize our individual and collective vulnerability. These are the things that we have told us as far back as uh, February this year. What all of this is about, let's have conversations with um, uh, Mr. Ola Oresanya, Commissioner for Environment in Auguste. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. We also have in our Abuja studio two gentlemen, Professor Shola Adepoju, former DG Forestry Research Institute of Nigeria. And sitting beside him is Mr. Engineer Clement uh, who is a Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency's uh, director. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Yeah, so let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Rezaia. Uh, we know the, pr the uh, projection or prediction of NIMED. What is the prediction for Ogun State? Yes, thank you. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you will probably understand why I say that. Yes. Uh, that's that flood release and all of those things. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Well, it starts from um, the national predictions. So we have to domesticate the national pre from the national predictions. So and uh, from the meteorological reports and uh, from the hydrological <clears throat> agency report. Uh, for Ogun State, yes, uh, about 16 of our... Local governments are going to be so vulnerable. They're going to have a high impact of flood, and uh, <clears throat> our, our own season will, will start. Uh, we're supposed to have started by March, and it will last to December. So that we're going to have uh, like about 259 days of rain um, in the upland area and uh, in the lower and the coastal area of the states it will grow longer so almost like about uh, 280 or 200 something days so uh, for us in Ugu state yes uh, we have uh, two patterns of uh, flood that we may expect and uh, that means we have the uh, inland flood coming uh, we we'll call down the flash flood the northern part of the state is prone to that because of the hilly areas that we have in the northern part of the state. So uh, we're going to have, from the torrential rain, we're going to have uh, the runoffs upstream, downstream. It's going to be very abrasive. And we're going to have more of erosion than uh, a stagnated uh, pond of water called flood. But in the southern part of the state, which uh, uh, has uh, mainly the coastal towns in the state, um, towards the end of the year, maybe from September, and uh, October and November, we're going to have what we call the coastal flooding. And uh, the coastal flooding will be aggravated uh, with a high tide that we are going to have around that time, especially around October, uh, between, uh, between the last week of September and the first week of October. We are likely to have uh, uh, the seasonal tide will be at the highest level at that time. So we're going to have a kind of a lockdown of a flow of uh, water from upland into the, into the lagoon. So around that time, we expect uh, uh, to have a coastal flooding. But all these are things we can manage, and uh, we already have our plans on how to make sure that, that we, we reduce, we minimize the impact these are going to have on our people. While we take advantage of the positive side of the rain, and uh, we also have a knowledge 
to inform our people, especially those in the construction mm -hmm. industry and the, and the farmers, when to plant, when not to plant, and for those who are in the construction area, when to work and not, when not I, to work. I think the challenge, and I'm glad that you, you already identified the number of local governments that will be affected by this. Right. Um, I think the challenge would be uh, what do the people do who live in residential areas that are bound to be flooded? Well, the, the first thing is uh, information. You need to know uh, when this will happen. So you need to prepare ahead for it. And uh, the level of preparedness uh, cuts across both the government, the people, and, uh, and uh, even the community um, uh, associations. So uh, most of the drainage facilities, they're shared facilities. They're shared facilities. So it's not about an individual preparation. It's a common agenda. That's a government side of it. Mm. And on our side, we are, we are working optimally to make sure that we minimize this impact. Anyway, uh, and there, there are questions around whether or not houses should have been allowed to be built in that in those areas in the first place. Don't answer that one yet. I'll come back okay. to you on <laughs> that one. Right. Let me ask uh, uh, Engineer Z. You know, uh, this this comes every year. You know, the information comes across to Nigerians. You know, from time to time that these things are going to happen, but you know. Yet, flooding still take place. We've heard now what the Ogun State government is doing about it. Do you get the same kind of vibe from the other 37, the other 35 states in the country? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, and I must say that uh, I'm impressed with what the commissioner from Ogun State is saying or has said with regards to what the state is doing. It shows that the state is conversant with the implications of the predictions made, one, by the Nigerian Meteorological Agency, NIMET, in February, and the one that was made by the Nigeria Hurricane Service Agency on the 16th of April. Like he rightly mentioned, the number of local government areas in the state that have been placed on red alert. Now, are the states responding? I think the message being passed by the predicting of forecasting agencies. The message is getting some level of traction, I mean, some level of uh, attention from the sub-nationals. I am aware of what other states are doing. If you go to Jigawa State, the government is doing a lot to ensure that uh, disaster that usually associate or go along with flooding we're not occur in Jigawa State. Lagos have been on the news as well. Though the commissioner that I listened to some time ago talked about uh, they're not demolishing, that they are removing structures. Some of them are within the canals, I mean the channels, the drainage canals. Action is taking place in many states. I'm sure what happened uh, you know, happen in Abia State too. And so on and so forth. The FCT has been a landmark example of getting prepared once they receive the, the advisories from NIMET and NISA. So I'm saying that uh, there is a, a, a high level, a high degree of improvement by the states in terms of responding mm -hmm. to the weather advisories to forestall any incident of a disaster that might occur. As for issue of flooding, is taken. So long as there is rainfall input, you can expect flooding at any point in time. But uh, what we try to avoid or minimize is the disaster that is associated with uh, flooding across the country. So there is a le high level of response, preparedness, being shown by a number of states in Nigeria. 
to ensure that they are, they, the citizens become safe in the course of rain, you know, flooding in 2024. Mm. Um, how pleased are you with uh, what is happening in Lagos State at the moment? Um, I'm sure you are following the news about um, demolitions and all that that are going on you know because they were because properties were built on floodplains and stuff like that how pleased are you and do you see that this is going to um ease the flooding that we see in lagos perennially to a large extent i will say yes that i'm pleased with the removal or demolition of structures that have been built within the waterways. There are several systems in Lagos, interconnected one way or the other, but then leading eventually to the canal, into the, you know, the lagoon or Atlantic Ocean. But when there are impediments on the free flow of uh, excess runoff, the government will someone the necessary political will to do that. Then we come back to another issue. Who issued the permit to build on such structures? They were not built overnight. We had time plan authorities all over the country. And there's some Minister of Environment, Water Resources, and so on and so forth. Or even state emergency management agencies, they all, they all exist. I think what the government should do is to cushion the effect. There should be compensation. Government apparatus, you know, gave approval for the such projects to be built. And if at the end of the day, because of so many changes that take place in our environment, climate change, meandering of our rivers and so on and so forth, and we call that a, a place we allocated before for people to build their houses, should rather be allocated to flood, let it be a waterway. There's nothing wrong in government you know, accepting that they did something in error and then compensate people whose properties, what millions of Naira have been affected. But to have a long lasting solution, it happened in Abuja around 2005, 2004, I can remember some structures in some streets in Abuja, two, three-story building, housing a hospital and other structures. They were all brought down. If you know Federal Ministry of Works in Mabushi, they block A. I think that should be about four or five-story building. It's no longer there. What you see is block B. The then Minister of the FCT had to demolish that whole block so as to revert the environment to its original planned use. So, for a long-lasting resort, save human lives, it is better to remove such structures. In 2022, which is the highest uh, flooding incident in Nigeria, more than 665 people died due to flood incident. And I think World Bank put the economic loss in that of finance, not less than $6.8 billion, and so on and so forth. Not talk about people who are dis displaced, people who are injured, and then the great lock on, on a major highway like a Buddha Lokoja highway. No movement could take place for weeks. So whatever that could be done to restore the integrity of our environment, I think uh, I support it. Mm. At the long run, it will be better for it. Okay. Well, Prof, let me, let me ask you this, because, you know, there are still questions around, I mean, and some of the issues that uh, Engineers has raised about government reserving um, flood areas or flood prone, flood prone areas for flooding. We'll come back to that one. How do you think this affects your expertise? Uh, but I mean, you're a former uh, DG of the Forestry Research Institute of Nigeria, so there has to be some kind of correlation that you think people need to understand when we talk about flooding as it affects our forestry or the environment generally. 
Thank you. I think uh, the correlation is uh, established already because uh, flooding itself is as a result of uh, too much removal of trees, of vegetation, because the runoff on the earth surface gather a speed from lack of vegetation. So when the vegetation is not there, the what the rain uh, fall gather is uh, strength and speed and become to cause what we call erosion and then turn to flood and began to cause the, the havoc that we are talking about. So we, we have no choice than to go back to uh, repopulating our forest estate. Ogun State is lucky and I think they've been quite conversant with the implication of uh, lack of forest of vegetation. Ogun State hosts the first man and site, Nigeria has since 1977, which is on a biosphere reserve. They are also the only state, I think, I wouldn't know whether any other state has joined them, that has a whole ministry for uh, forestry, knowing the importance of having forestry uh, when managing a state. And that's why you could talk about, the commissioner could talk about having uh, two patterns of rain in their state. And until we embrace um, in, increasing our forest estate, we we'll continue to talk about flooding and uh, this water runoff because once you have the forest estate in place and we are satisfying the requirement of the United Nations that we should have at least minimum of 25% forest cover, not only of our country alone, even a state should be working towards having its minimum at least of 25%. We're not saying you should stop at 25. There's nothing wrong in having even up to 40%. And we are always thinking when we want to have urban, there's urban forestry also, that you are developing uh, a town into a city of a state has not stopped us from also planting up the state or the, the capital. Uh, having trees around your houses, in the avenue, in the median of the road, all of this contribute to uh, improving the climate uh, uh, um, uh, resilience of our environment and also reduce the rate and speed with which this rainwater run to turn to erosion and flooding and begin to rain havoc upon our people. So until we begin to go back to the basis and meeting the requirement as uh, stipulated by United Nations, then we cannot uh, uh, end this discussion on flooding and the havoc associated with it. Thank you. Prof, Professor, you know, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, to, to quickly follow up on what you said about forest estates and all, um, exactly what is it that informs eroding our forest reserves? Is it that the state plans are eroded by state officials? What exactly do you think is responsible for that one, where uh, you know, we now have flooding, trees being felled, when, I don't know, talk to us about what has happened over time and how we can, we can put pay to them. We're, we're all guilty of it. The state is guilty of it. The, the communities around this forest are also guilty of it and also the policy makers are also guilty of it. Uh, I will take the Ogun State we're talking about as an example. In the Mobile itself, uh, I think in an attempt for states to sustain their revenue generation, uh, you'll find um, the sawmillers that we call loggers uh, who claim to have one allocation or the other. I know the state is working on how to put an end to that. But as I speak, you can't go to a mobile sphere itself without finding uh, there are trucks around and they, some of them work illegally even at night, uh, do all of these uh, atrocities at night and before morning, they have chattered away uh, a lot of uh, logs there in, the, in the forest uh, estate there. Uh, in the process of doing that, they also uh, poach on our animals, uh, which uh, is also not uh, a good uh, testimony of uh, that environment. So the state also had to put uh, their, their enforcement uh, uh, actors uh, on their ease to do what is necessary. If you go around 
Ogiri area through to uh, uh, Lagos area there, you find a lot of these containers who are probably uh, logged at night. And also some of the logs you find there are not even from Ogo State, but they find the sun mills there closer to the port where they bring even uh, log of woods from even northern part of the country. Uh, but uh, they find it easier to sort to the size required around Ogo State. So all actors are one blame or the other. But I think Ogo State uh, are always uh, willing to listen to expertise advice. And I'm using this opportunity to also please plead with the commissioner who is also here with us that we can do better because Ogo, uh, that Omobaswa is uh, is the pride of the, the, of the country, and UNESCO is excited about what we're doing there. That's the only forest where you can still find over 50 wide elephants uh, roaming in that forest. You can still find uh, pythons roaming uh, freely uh, in the place. Remember, we have a rule in the forest that they have the right of way. You cannot take any life of any wild animal where you're in their domain uh, because you are the one intruding into the environment. So uh, all of us have one role or the other to play, but as I speak to you, we are not protecting our uh, forest estate. Uh, one way or the other, either the state is thinking of making uh, or generating revenue from it, or those who are supposed to be repopulating the forest probably are also not getting adequate funding to do that. And also those who are living on the forest, I'm talking about the sawmillers and the loggers, also uh, making up one way or the other to make sure they sustain their livelihood. So we all have to come back to the drawing board, sit together and find a better way to manage our forest estate because we're depleting. Uh, last year I spoke with you, I said we're about 7.6. As I speak to you now, I'm not sure we're up to 5% forest cover in this country. Thank you. Uh, Prof, just staying stay with you for just a moment. Um, how is the tree planting campaign going? Uh, you see, the uh, tree planting campaign uh, to us in the, in the, in the, in the discipline, we, we don't find it as uh, the, the important aspect of planting trees. Because uh, planting trees alone is just about 10% of the process. When there's no follow-up management of that tree you planted for at least three to four years, it's not going to survive. Even we, the expert, when we plant one hectare, we have what we call a dieback of about 10% that we we'll still have to go back and do what we call beating up. That's filling the gap of those that you planted and that died, and you replant them again to make sure that you are fairly 90-something uh, percent at the end of the day that survive the planting. But when we do tree planting campaign, we just the euphoria, everybody gather, we plant the trees and walk away. Who is going to manage what you planted? Who is going to survive what you plant? Okay. I mean, what you have planted because okay. uh, adequate watering, uh, what we call uh, rain weeding of this plant and uh, uh, beating up and all of this need to follow up. And the cost of managing a single tree after planting to survivor is almost 90% of the cost of planting. Okay. So it's not just planting and walking away. Mm. You need to manage that particular tree for three to four years. When it's stable, then you can walk away. Well, you know, yeah. interestingly, well, part of the issues that have been raised um, is that of our own discipline or a lack of it. You know, Victor Owo on Twitter is saying, well, on X says, there should be serious fines charged to food vendors in our street corners. They sell noodles and eggs and throw all their waste inside the gutters as the drainage. I still saw two spots this morning, and I know they did it because their stands are close by. This must stop. Let me ask you, uh, how do you deal with such issues? I'm uh, sorry, Sonia. Well, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> that, that's got to do with um, uh, community lifestyle and the uh, kind of urbanization that we have. And uh, yes, it's, it's not very good for us. For I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a manager of uh, the environment, and I think uh, these are some of the challenges, uh, the informal settlers that you see around the corner. So um, what, what you do for such, all right, it's, it's like um, a kind of an enforcement. You have to coerce them to comply. 
into the normal thing. So um, you you have a kind of a bean that you put in the community for them where they can actually take this, their waste and dump it in bean. And that will be the condition under which will permit them to stay there. All right, so it, it's, a, it's a very tough one to manage their informal settlers and they have a right to, to be in the town. So do what they have to do. You compel them to have containers or to have a trash bags. You give them trash bags and uh, they move it to uh, the containers where they have to put it. So we have, just have to care for them. Okay. Um, Mr. Enze, um, I'm sure I have asked you this question before. Um, in, in many climes, people don't step out of their houses until after they have heard the weather report. Has your agency considered giving us a daily weather report? Mr. Anza, did you hear me? No. Has your agency considered giving Nigerians a daily weather or hourly weather report? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. We, we have worked on that so that no matter where you are in the country, you will be able to get daily information with regards to flooding. The, currently, I am sure, I know that the Nigerian Medical Agency is doing that, giving daily weather reports. What agency, but please? Our, on our Climate. own part, as the agency in charge of flood forecast or prediction, our, our app has not been properly or fully developed. We are working on that. So that no matter where you are, no matter the type of uh, cell phone you have, whether Android or these uh, uh, very low ones, no matter the community where you are, so long as there is network, you could be able to access information. So to answer your question, yes, we have considered you know, giving a daily information with regard to flooding. But take note, okay. the issue of flood doesn't occur all year round. It is from the onset of rainy season or when the rainy season has been established across the country or in some locations. The ground being saturated that you can talk of a flooding. Unlike other weather parameters like a, maybe temperature, humidity, all kinds of things that are on daily basis. Hmm. So the agency is already working on that. And I hope that before the end of the year, we'll be able to develop it properly and launch it. All right, well, uh, uh, engineers, at least you, you answered for NIMET one way or the other because you, you, your, your agency is to give information about flooding and you said NIMET is to give the weather reports. But what my colleague is, the point she's making is that it's not as popular as it should be because hardly, I don't know if any, of anyone who gets those things uh, unless they, are, they have um, the smart devices that can give them the daily weather reports. I don't even know whether or not we take them seriously. But let me ask, uh, you know, Prof, one more time uh, about this particular one. Most of our forest reserves and all, they are more in the local areas. They are more in the uh, rural areas, the, the hinterlands and the rest of them. Are we conversing with them enough to be able to defend these things when poachers come. Thank you. What, what we we'll do now is to change our approach to this uh, rural uh, uh, reserve that we, you talked about. And what we we'll do there now is to uh, start planting those uh, tree uh, crop or tree. Uh, that the rural communities has a uh, relationship with, uh, what we call socio-cultural relationship, either it's a cultural plant or it's a socio-economic plant uh, that they want to raise, uh, that they wouldn't want anybody to tamper with, so that independent of our involvement, they have this uh, commitment to protect it because uh, it's uh, benefiting them either culturally or economically. Uh, and i give you an example. We went to a community at a time to uh, establish a plantation. 
And I told uh, my boss that asked us to go and plant there that, okay, uh, what we're going to do is to take 10 different seedlings to that community and we'll leave it at the village square. So we, we went to that community in Okoma, Cross River State. We left the 10 species of seedlings in the village square. And he was wondering what I want to do with that experiment. I said, tomorrow morning, I will explain better to him. When we came the following morning, we realized that the only seedling that was taken away from that village square was the Jatrova Kakos. And he was angry, thinking his people are uh, not represented in well. And I said, no, they've just passed our exam. That tells us that the only species they're interested in that village is the Jatrova Kakos, and that's what we're going to plant in that community that they can protect. Any other thing other than that. So what we do is that we don't impose any species or ceiling on any community again. If you want them to nurture and protect and defend it, plant what they want and what they can benefit from. And that's Absolutely. the approach we're adopting now. That's Thank a smart you. way to go about it. But well, let me ask you, Mr. Arisonia, uh, you spoke about some communities that are likely to be affected by some kinds of flooding later on in the year. What would be your message to them now? Of which are these communities, if you can mention, if you have about 45 seconds, and what would you be saying to them now mm -hmm. in preparation? Oh, yes, uh, the first thing is that I will encourage them to listen to uh, weekly uh, advisory on the rainfall pattern. Where? It's on our radio Where? programs okay. uh, in Abekuta. We have on our OGBC uh, between 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and 11 o'clock. We give this out and uh, we give uh, this advice. So we have a database of all the CDS in Northern States and uh, we send a message almost on a weekly basis to the CDA chairman chairman to, to disseminate this information among the people so they, they should listen to their city and their communities and listen to this radio program or go to our website uh, the Ogun State Minister of Environment website and uh, we have this information on weekly basis yeah. and uh, this this precision is usually very high then the Farmers Association they should clean up I mean they should they should work closely with us you know, we are working with the Minister of Agri in that area so yeah. information is the first thing then uh, removing incumbrances from from the community drainage, the CDs should work together uh -huh. with the residents, and this is the time to work. Mm -hmm. We continue on our own part to make sure the primary trunks and secondary trunks are open. We continue to dredge, but the tertiary trunks, which is the gutter in front of the houses, the community, the CDs should work with their people to make sure they clean it up uh, right now. Mm -hmm. And those who are in the coastal areas of the state, they should listen to us. We'll let them know when water will come. And we are working with the Ogunoshu River Basin Authority closely to make sure that the water from that uh, dam will not be released maximally mm. during the high tide. Okay. So we are synchronizing this uh, effectively mm. now. Well, it's, a, it's quite a lot to, to swallow, and I hope that they are listening to you right I now. So too. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, well, just this one comment uh, from Onoja. So most of the actions on environmental protection yeah. start and end at the policy levels in the states and at the federal levels. Taking practical action, actions up to community levels holds the key to environmental resilience. And I think you and the Prof have spoken to that one. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you, Ralph. So, Laura Senya is Commissioner for the Environment in Ogun State. Professor Shola Adepoju, former DG, Forestry Research Institute of Nigeria. And Engineer Clement Nze is from the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, our pleasure, please. Thank, Thank you, it was our pleasure. All right, so um, up next, we're still talking about the environment one way or the other, but this time, a focus on Lagos. Do stay with us.